So welcome everybody for coming to the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose here at UCL. We're super happy to welcome Simon Sharp back. He's an IFPP fellow, I'll give you a proper introduction in a minute, and Chris Rapley, who together we've actually been on a, what was it called, high level advisory board for the European Space Agency's future missions with uh, humans uh, on the, what was that actually called? Human something? Human exploration. <laughs> Human exploration. Very good. Um, so it's, it's just such a great honor to be able to launch your book, uh, Simon. We've been working together at the Institute with you for some time when you were still in government. Um, this day, uh, this evening, we're launching his book, Five Times Faster, Rethinking the Science, Economics, and Diplomacy of Climate Change. And Simon was just saying how appropriate it was that we had a scientist, an economist, and a diplomat talking about uh, your book. Um, just to say that this event is actually happening just before we kick off our Entrepreneurial State 2.0 Festival, where for about six months, is that right, Angela? That's it? Okay, <laughs> until the end of June. For three months, we're gonna have lots of different events that look at kind of what is the role of science, what is the role of innovation, and actually helping to steer the economy to tilt the playing field, not just level the playing field, towards achieving growth that is more inclusive and sustainable. What's the new way that the public sector, the private sector, civil society, philanthropies can actually work together to achieve a goal-oriented economy. So this is a great way to kick us off on what is the structure of an innovation system that both produces great science, but also can be useful. We were just talking about Pastora's quadrant, which I'm sure we'll get to in the uh, discussion. So uh, usefulness of science is, of course, very different from it being directed top down. So really quickly, just some um, bios here. Simon is currently the Director of Economics for the UN Climate Champions. He's also Senior Fellow at WRI. He is, um, he is also a Policy uh, Fellow here at IPP. And one of our, I think, best working papers was written with Simon precisely on, I think, an underlying topic of this book, which is, why is economics getting it so wrong? Why does it continue to pretend that the world is static and unchanging and use a body, for example, of mathematics that comes more from Newtonian physics, um, which is all based on equilibria, on averages, the representative agent when you take micro 101, why is that the wrong way to actually set up the modeling uh, for a system actually that is inherently dynamic? Not a perfect system, it's not that it produces great outcomes necessarily, but it's definitely dynamic. And of course, Marx wrote about that a lot as well, and he was one of the biggest critics of capitalism. Um, he was the deputy director of the UK government's COP26 unit, where he led international campaigns on energy, transport, science, and innovation. And he's also developed the approach to clean growth in the UK's industrial strategy. And I should also say that we together helped make the UK's industrial strategy stop being sector specific. At the time, the sectors were aerospace, automobiles, uh, the creative sector, finance, and um, life sciences towards being challenge oriented, right? So sustainable mobility is a challenge that then the sector called transport needs to change itself in order to deliver. So that was you know, a real wonderful uh, experience we had together. And Chris Rapley is a professor of climate science at UCL, and we were both saying how great UCL is in terms of really fostering kind of interdisciplinary and cross-faculty thinking. Um, his previous posts include director of the Science Museum in London, in 2008, he was awarded the Edinburgh Science Medal for having made a significant contribution to the understanding and well-being of humanity. So this wonderful book has, as I just mentioned, it has these three kind of uh, sections on um, the science, what's wrong with it, and Chris is gonna talk a lot about that. Uh, economics, what's wrong with it, I blab about that all the time, <laughs> and diplomacy. Um, so what we're gonna do now is have 20 minutes from Simon presenting us some of the key takeaways from the book, and then we'll get into a discussion, and of course we'll open it up to the audience, so do start uh, preparing your questions. We also have some online uh, people, is that right? Nye, you're gonna help us uh, bring those questions. Nye, by the way, is one of our PhD students, and she's doing incredible work on looking at the science behind what's called data science and how problematic it is actually when we bring social problems into that, like our health inequities. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mariana. Um, before I get into it, I've got to say it's really nice to be here in IIPP. And 
You mentioned the industrial strategy work. I think we had something like 32,000 responses to the government's initial consultation on an industrial strategy and what it should do. And probably at least half of the responses from economists were a bit conflicted about whether we should have a strategy at all. And it was wading through these one after the other, trying to find anything there that's helpful that could get us started. Finally, came across one from Mariana saying, why don't you have a strategy that tries to solve some problems? <laughs> get good at solving problems and you might be able to sell stuff that other people can also use to solve the same problems. I thought, yeah, that kind of makes sense. All right, I need to talk to this person. And, and there we started. So um, it's, you've been a huge support by the work that IIPP has done it's given legitimacy to people challenging some bad ideas, and that's an incredibly valuable thing for an academic institute to do. So, as you said, there are three parts in this, the science, economics, and diplomacy of climate change. And the context is that if we're going to meet climate change goals, we have to decarbonize the global economy five times faster this decade than we managed over the last two decades. That sounds hard. It probably is hard. And it's definitely hard if we don't change the way we're going about it. And my starting premise is that the stuff we have to change is not just the above ground stuff that we can see. Um, it's also the invisible infrastructure, not just the pipelines and the sewers and, and the electricity wires, but the invisible infrastructure of ideas and institutions. In each of these three areas, we have some that are getting in the way when they should be helping us. So science first. The science part is really all about the difference between prediction and risk assessment. And Chris used to often hear me tell this story about the boiling frog, where humanity is supposed to be a boiling frog, and we don't notice that the water is getting warmer until it's too late. But imagine he has a science advisor, and he says, uh, what's going on here? And the scientist goes, yeah, yeah, I, the, you're right, it's getting warmer. In five minutes' time, I reckon it will be two degrees warmer, plus or minus one degree. And the frog goes, yeah, OK, but actually, I didn't want a prediction. I wanted a risk assessment. The scientist goes, oh, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, for a start, what's the worst that could happen? And the scientist goes, oh, that's easy. You boil to death. That's the worst that could happen. And oh, how likely is that? Oh, well, in five minutes' time, it definitely won't happen. 10 minutes' time, 50-50. 20 minutes' time, 100%. Oh, OK. <laughs> Getting out of it there. The vast majority of the charts in the IPCC reports and the research that's underlying them are this kind, a prediction, impact over time. Whereas what we really need to know is first, instead of first saying what's most likely to happen and then how bad is it, ask the questions the other way around. First, what's the worst that could happen? And then how likely is it? Probability over time. That's what we really need. And because we're doing it the wrong way around, we don't know as much as we need to know about thresholds, thresholds of nonlinear impact. Like, for example, when heat and humidity conditions exceed the human body's limit for tolerance, which <coughs> never happens in the world at the moment. This would mean that even if you're young, fit and healthy, lying down in the shade, tipping water over yourself to keep cool, you still die of heat stress. And the last IPCC report seven years ago said nothing about that in the summary for policymakers because they had a rule that you needed two research papers that had come to the same conclusion. Sorry, and Angela, can we get rid of the thing that's how do you say, hiding the titles? Oh, yeah. Is that about just click the X, maybe? Thanks, go on. And uh, yeah, th they actually thought it understated the risk, but they needed two pieces of research that had um, arrived at the same conclusion. And it turned out that of the 12,000 papers cited in this report, only one of them had addressed the question of, if the world gets warmer, might it get too hot for people? There were quite a lot more that had looked at skiing and grape growing in Europe. Um, and eight years on, I've found that the difference has actually widened. This time, there is zero papers referred to in the IPCC sixth assessment report that explicitly discuss this threshold. And there's a nice pull-out box on wine growing with 60 different references. So the world might be going to shit, but we all know where our next drink's coming from. <laughs> um, another one that's not so well known, limit of London's tolerance for heat stress, around about five or six meters. Very few people I've ever met in the UK government know that our best estimate for long-term sea level rise at two degrees of climate change is double that, about 12 meters. So London's future could well be shorter than its past, which is a shame. We also know less than we might like to know about these thresholds in the time climate system, the physical climate system. 
And this is just, you can see that by how much the expert judgment has changed over time. So few people are looking into this that they really got it radically wrong to begin with. The risk is much larger than they used to think. Um, and of course, all of these tipping points in the Earth system are connected to each other. You tip one, the other ones become more likely. And, well, how stable is the whole system altogether? We don't know. Again, hardly any papers have actually looked into this and discussed it explicitly. It's not discussed in the summaries for policymakers. And what there is tends to be communicated extremely cautiously. And something that was pointed out by scientists and insurance professionals when we work together on risk assessment is they have the opposite meaning of certain words and concepts. If you say conservative in the insurance industry, it means understating what could go badly wrong and preparing for it. Sorry, I said that the wrong way around. It means overstating it. Prepare for more than the worst that could happen. Whereas in science, a conservative statement of your results is one that understates the results. Diametrically opposite, the opposite risk tolerances, error biases. So if you want a good risk assessment, you can't rely on the scientists to do it. Ask them to give you all the information you need and then have some other people who have different error bias to do the risk assessment. So science has a few things going wrong. Um, but I think economics is actually in a much worse position. <laughs> um, and this is because most of the economics we have in government is founded on the idea of equilibrium, whether we realize it or not. And this is a situation in which nobody has any immediate reason to change their actions so that the status quo can continue. That doesn't sound very much like the situation that we face with climate change, where the IPCC has said what we need is rapid and far-reaching system transitions in the global economy on an unprecedented pace and scale. Uh, you could say those are situations where everybody has to change their actions so the status quo is completely turned upside down quickly. So we need to stop thinking about the economy as an equilibrium system, uh, stop thinking of it as a machine, start imagining it as a disequilibrium system, like an ecosystem, which it probably is, not just uh, metaphorically, but literally, because we're all animals going about interacting with each other uh, and the natural world. And so instead of being static, predictable, functioning or failing, it's actually evolving, uncertain, it's got unlimited possibilities, and it doesn't function or fail. So what do we see about the advice we're getting from equilibrium-based e economics and what we're finding out from the real world? Well, we're told that carbon pricing is the most efficient way to decarbonize the economy, but we find out the opposite. Investment is much more effective, especially early in a transition. And it's been investment that meant global solar deployment in 2020 was about 14 times higher than anybody thought it would be 15 years earlier. Now, why? It's all because of feedbacks. Equilibrium doesn't have reinforcing feedbacks because they blow up the model. It can only handle diminishing ones. But we've known for decades that reinforcing feedbacks exist in new technologies. You get economies of scale, you get learning by doing, you get complementary technologies coming out, and you have this macro kind of feedback between investment, innovation, and demand. So that's why. That's why it works. So dynamically speaking, investing in the new system is much more effective than taxing in the old early in the transition. And of course, you can think about that with historical examples. Transition from horses to cars. We did it by investing in motors, factories, motorways, writing the highway code, we didn't do all that just by putting a tax on horseshit. Why would we expect this to be any different when we're moving from fossil fuels to clean technologies? Second thing is regulation. Regulation has a bad name. We're always told it's burdensome. It's, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt one last time. There's eight places here in the front. The <laughs> back there is getting filled up with people who can't even see us because you're behind a column. Come up, there's eight places. And if, if you come close enough, you can read a very important name. <laughs> a very important name on this slide, which is Mr. S. Chu. That is Stephen Chu. He was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, published about 500 papers on physics, and then became energy secretary to Barack Obama. I don't know how the Americans managed to get such good ministers. Uh, nothing wrong with us, of course, but you know, that's impressive. <laughs> Um, and Stephen Chu wanted to have good, strong energy efficiency standards for home appliances, like fridges and washing machines and all that stuff. And he knew he'd have to fight political battles, but he thought at least his own department would be on his side. 
But the economists kept producing impact assessments that said this would push up the prices. And so at some point, I don't know when he actually found time, but I, I do sort of empathize. He, he went off and did an academic study, his first ever paper on economics, looked at the actual data and found that when the tough appliances standards came in, they accelerated cost reduction, <laughs> they accelerated innovation. Not just because less energy was used, they pushed down the prices of those products. And of course, as he said, that was the opposite of what the equilibrium-based economics expected. Now, why is that? Well, it's not really surprising. What you're doing there is you're shifting resources from exploiting a position that a sector is in to exploring for something new. In evolutionary terms, you're changing the fitness function of that part of the ecosystem. The one way I think about it is imagine there's a big, this river is a big flow of finance coming from consumers to producers going through a sector, but regulation just reallocates it, diverts some of that to a different place and says, you know what? you're going to have to do some work, actually. You can only sell products in this sector if they meet this standard. And you don't know how to do it now? Well, tough. That's what you have to do. So go away and figure it out. Fewer returns to shareholders, more investment in research and innovation. Get something good. Final um, done investment, regulation, tax. Let's say we are going to put a tax on carbon. How high should it be? Well, the traditional advice is, it's the absolute value that matters. You price it at the social cost of carbon equivalent to the damages of climate change. But that's just a made up number, it's somewhere between naught and infinity. So it doesn't help you very much. What if you're thinking in system terms, then you realize it's the relative value that matters. If you use tax at all, use it to activate a tipping point between the clean technology and the fossil system. And when you do that, you find, oh, you get the fastest transitions in the world. The UK's power sector transitioned eight times faster than the global average. Norway's transition to electric vehicles a few years ago when I wrote this paper, it was their EV market share was 20 times higher than the global average. So these are not small. You activate the tipping point, you make some good progress. And of course, you don't want the same carbon price across the whole economy. That's an allocative efficiency concept. It only works if the economy is static, if no technologies ever change. If technologies are changing, you need the right measures in each sector. You can think of each one like a hill you have to get over. Your R&D, your subsidies, your investment push you up. Finally, a bit of tax might just tip you over the top. And of course, those are different in each sector. So what's good for cars is grossly inefficient for steel, and it's way more than you need in power. So I, I had to include one of Mariana's slogans here. And this is about strategy. Let's say you're, you've understood how to use the investment, the regulation, and the tax, but where are you trying to go? Actually, direction matters. <laughs> Innovation is political because the economy is path dependent. You can end up in different places. So in the UK, we tried really hard to have technology neutral policies in the power sector. Every step of the way we discovered that was impossible. And the time when it really came home to me was when we suddenly realized that we might accidentally give loads of money to biomass. Loads of subsidies, public money, going to burning wood. It was shipped across the Atlantic in big dirty ships after cutting down forests in North America. And we looked at it and went, maybe that's not the technology option for the 21st century that's going to create jobs and UK exports. So it really matters, the choice of direction. And you either choose deliberately or accidentally. The final part, um, diplomacy. And this, this is the part I've been most heavily involved in individually, so I can be rudest about this if I like. Um, but it, it's linked to the economics, uh, because at the beginning, all the models were saying it's going to decarbonization is going to add costs. And actually, the Nordhaus model is unbelievably bad, because not only is it always a cost to reduce emissions, but whatever you do one year, the next year, you're back at the same starting point, and you have to do it all over again because it's such a static economy. So it's basically like Sisyphus pushing his boulder up the hill and it always rolls back down again. Luckily, it's not like that. The transition does have another side to the hill. We're going somewhere better and beyond a certain point, it becomes easier, not more difficult. And once you understand the economy in that way, it transforms how you think about the diplomacy. It's no longer a negative sum game. It's not about dividing up the pie of finite global carbon emissions. It's about positive sum diplomacy in a dynamic economy, figuring out how we work together to get to a clean economy that's better than the fossil fuel economy that we left behind. And you suddenly realize there are all these very real coordination gains. 
larger economies of scale, stronger incentives for investment, level playing fields where you need them. There's a load of stuff that countries can do together that they can't do on their own. And we've more or less ignored this for the last 30 years of climate change diplomacy. And of course, think back about those reinforcing feedbacks. Well, if you've got countries pushing in the same direction, you have all those on a larger scale. They're all stronger. So three ways that we need to change climate diplomacy. The first, focus cooperation within sectors. And the point here is, when diplomacy has ever been useful in the past, it's when it broke problems down into meaningful, uh, manageable chunks. So the most obvious example is, if you want to solve conflict in the world, you don't get all the countries in the world around the table and try and agree a legally binding treaty on world peace. Actually, it's been done once before, 1928. It was called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, 1928, so it didn't really last very long. That doesn't work. You have to break them up into meaningful pieces. Agriculture is not the same as aviation. Steel is not the same as shipping. The technologies are different. The international connections are different. The countries that matter are different. So you have to break it up. Second thing is don't get 196 countries around the table because obviously that will make your lowest common denominator as low as it could possibly be. And you don't need that. In most sectors, about 10 countries give you 75% of global production and consumption. That's enough. Cars, 10 countries, 75% of the global market. In fact, three rule makers in Beijing, Brussels, and Washington, or even California when Washington's having a bad year, gets you over half of the global car market. And those three together, if they all regulate for 100% emission, uh, zero emission vehicle share of car sales by 2035, they can bring forward the tipping point of cost parity between EVs and petrol cars by five years. Get the three of them to agree on that, you've made it a hell of a lot easier for the whole world. Get the entire rest of the world to agree on that as well, and you've only brought it forward by another one year. And I had to put this in because it's inspired by your good friend Carlota Perez. That she writes about technological revolutions as starting in the industrial core of the world, wherever that is at the time, and spreading outwards to the periphery. And that's surely going to happen this time, for better or for worse. The industrial core now surely includes China as well as G7 countries. Now, this is why we shouldn't be doing things like international carbon trading or emissions offsetting. Because you do that, you take the pressure away from the core and you say, we'll do something on the periphery instead. That's the last thing you want to do. Maximize pressure on the core and you'll get fast change globally. Uh, final thing is about time scale of diplomacy. We spend all this time talking about long-term targets. But just look a minute at the targets China set for solar PV deployment. Its original one, you can't tell the difference between that and the x-axis. And then it went up and it went up and it went up. And eventually what happened in 2020 was off the scale compared to any of the targets they ever had. So it was actually the actions that were important, not the targets. Why? Well, one is you don't have confidence early in the transition. You don't know what you can do. You haven't yet seen the reinforcing feedbacks and the effect they have. And the other is, almost by definition, early in the transition, your interests are not aligned with the transition. Very few people have a stake in it succeeding at the beginning. But as it goes along, you create interest groups and you create people who have a stake in the transition and they push harder and everybody wants it and you find not only can you go faster, but you want to go faster. And that happened here because of two things. One, the rapidly declining cost of solar PV, which was an outcome of deployment. And two, China's increasing share of the world market went from a few percent to about 70% of the global solar market within a decade. So those interests changed radically. And if you want high leverage, that's where you have to focus, the present, not the future. So what does this mean in the three-dimensional space of climate change diplomacy? It means there is a point of least leverage, which is where we've been focused for the last 30 years, which is long-term economy-wide emissions targets discussed amongst all the countries in the world. And there's an opposite point, almost opposite, which is a point of maximum leverage, which is small groups focused on specific sectors talking about present actions. That could get us going much faster. Um, a good thing is, some countries got together, in fact, 45 of them, 70% of the global economy at COP26, and said they would try and do that, activating tipping points in each sector 
where the clean thing becomes more affordable, accessible and attractive than the fossil thing. And of course, like the climate, if you cross one tipping point, it increases your chances of crossing others in the global economy. And that is good news. That is why we actually do have a chance of doing it five times faster. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was absolutely brilliant. And um, Keynes had this great quote. He said, practitioners on the ground who are just trying to get the job done, whether it's on climate or transport, are often slaves of defunct economic theory. So I'll reflect on what you've talked about in terms of defunct economic theory. I'll hand over first to Chris, though, on the defunct way that we're thinking about science. Okie doke, thank you, Mariana. Hello, everybody. Um, can I just say one thing? I, I, I buy a lot of books. Uh, in fact, in my uh, office, I have a book wall. Um, and what Simon has done, he's, he's written a book that's worth reading, uh, because in it, you find lots of aha moments as you work your way through it, and it's very rare that you do that. So many books are 500 words that could have been just summarized on the front page. They really annoy me. I really recommend buying this one. It has an aha moment every so often as you work through it, and they're very important aha moments. So I've been asked, I'm the scientist here, I've been asked to talk about uh, the, the shortcomings of the science community. What I would say is that the science community has been very good at what it thought it should be doing. And what it thought it should be doing was the kind of prediction uh, that, uh, that Simon um, uh, outlined earlier on. Um, and it, it, there have been a growing number of people in that community who realize that impact is actually what one needs to justify one's uh, salary for. Um, particularly because they've been claiming that climate science is policy relevant science, which it, which it should be. But there has been this misconception about what needs to be delivered. And I, I thought I'd just have a look and see how things are doing. And, and I don't know how many of you keep an eye on the bits of social media or the media that tell you how the climate system is performing. But uh, over the last few days, um, carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere has reached 424 parts per million, which is the highest not only in human history, but the highest for, what, 4 million years or something like that. Um, and so you go, oh, well, that doesn't sound too good. Um, but it's actually a pretty useless piece of information because it doesn't tell you uh, what the energy imbalance of the planet is being driven by greenhouse gases because it doesn't tell you anything about methane, nitrous oxide, uh, the aerosols, uh, CFCs, and so on. And what it doesn't tell you is how close you are to critical thresholds that people care about. I mean, do you care whether the atmosphere's got 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in it? Uh, I don't think you can. What really matters is, is the planet gathering more energy than it is radiating away into space? And I can tell you it is. And just to put that uh, in scale, it's as if every person on the planet, 8.8 uh, 8 billion of us, had 40 one and a half kilowatt electric kettles running continuously, pouring water into the ocean. It's 20 times, or nearly 20 times, the amount of energy that humanity generates each day to run the modern world. So it doesn't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to say, well, wait a minute, if something we're doing is causing an impact on the planet, which is 20 times greater than the thing we're doing, that doesn't sound like it's a very sensible thing to do. So the fact that CO2 is where it is has caused a lot of uh, concern on the internet and elsewhere, but it's actually not really a very useful piece of information. So all of that heat, 94% uh, of that heat is going into the ocean. So another alarming statistic is that the average um, sea surface temperature globally reached 21.1 degrees centigrade this week, um, which is the highest again. It's a record, highest in the, um, uh, in the record, um, and probably the highest again for you know, millions of years. Um, the reason that it's going up is that there has been a La Nina event in the Pacific, which is a, a way the water is distributed in the way it overturns and releases heat to the atmosphere. And for the last three years, the La Nina has been suppressing the warming that we feel in the rest of the planet, because the ocean couples very strongly to the atmosphere. And so what we're watching is the emergence of an El Nino, which is going to give us a very interesting roller coaster ride later this year, as that heat is released into the atmosphere and then carried over the land. So I thought, well, let's have a look at what the land temperatures are doing. There, there have been springtime records in temperatures all over the, uh, all over the planet. 
Um, but this week it was uh, 41.7 degrees in Myanmar, 42 degrees in Bangladesh, 43.5 in India, 44 in Pakistan, and 45.4 in Thailand. All of these are records for this time of year. But again, what does that tell us? It tells us it's very hot, but does it tell us how humans are responding to it? And again, if you read Simon's book, he makes the point that what matters to a human is the so-called wet bulb temperature, not the dry temperature. So how much humidity is there? I could not find a single value for wet bulb temperature. And yet, if it is above 32 degrees, which is less than the 35 broadly used as the, as the existent, literally the existential limit, um, then people will be dying if they're exposed to those uh, wet bulb temperatures for more than a few hours. And particularly so if things don't cool below a wet bulb temperature of 25 degrees at night. So the system is still, and, and, and these data are being generated by systems like the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the Copernicus system in Europe. They're using billions of euros and dollars worth of satellites and, and uh, uh, floats floating in the ocean, but they're still not reporting the information that we actually need to do things properly. So the scientific community is doing amazing work, but it is not quite targeted. Now, this isn't a new thought. Jane Lubchenco, who some of you may have heard of, of um, a very senior and very uh, accomplished uh, marine scientist, marine biologist in the United States who rose to uh, lead the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. She ran the, she was president of the um, American uh, Association for uh, uh, Science. In 1997-98, uh, she gave a, a, a seminal um, speech and uh, published it as a paper uh, called um, uh, Entering the Century of the Environment. Remember, this is just before the millennium. A new social contract for science in which she said that uh, facing urgent and unprecedented changes in the Earth system, the science community has an obligation to serve society better. In other words, to think how its um, uh, out outputs will be genuinely policy useful, not just policy relevant. Well, um, 20 years later, she and I ran a special session at uh, uh, the American Geophysical Union uh, meeting in San Francisco um, called uh, Is Environmental Science Serving or Failing Society? And Jane's paper was Our Moment of Truth, Has the Social Contract Been Realized? And although there was some good news that uh, a number of scientists had seen that paper, recognized the, the seminal importance of it, and had tried voluntarily to push against the institution and deliver the sorts of things that Simon is recommending should be delivered, what is called use-inspired science. So neither basic science nor application science, but something in between, something that's looking at the basics, but with a result that is useful to humanity in mind. Um, and she concluded that the culture of academia is still an impediment. Mm -hmm. So in academia, in order to get along, in order to get money, in order to publish, in order to be promoted, there is a huge emphasis on novelty, discovering something new. If you discover something second, you're not famous. If you discover it first, you get the Nobel Prize. And that focuses attention on discovering the intricacies of the system and not thinking hard enough about how that could be useful in society. So the institution is pushing the wrong way. That's why progress was so slow over those 20 years. During that time period, I was involved in setting up a huge program, 60 nations, 60,000 scientists, 200 projects called the International Polar Year, which was to take a snapshot of the polar regions in 2007, 2008. We started late. Uh, we only started in 2004, but we did it. So what's going on here? Well, it seems that within the science community and within its institutions, there are some things that can be accelerated because the time constants are short, because you're moving along the grain of the institution. But if you want to change the institution, the time scale is very long. So I'll just finish by saying um, I broke my wrist um, uh, a week or so ago. It took a, a fraction of a second to break. Uh, that's actually a, a truth. It's always easier to break things than to mend them, but th that's not the point I'm making. It is going to take six to eight weeks before I get this horrible green thing off my arm and a year before it mends. That is a time constant about which I can do nothing. And given how urgent the need is to change the world, to transform the way we power finance and run the world, 
within these institutions, my recommendation is that we find the ones where we can work along the grain and uh, get those accelerators that uh, Simon was talking about and not waste our time on the ones where the time constants are too long for the moment. We'll need to deal with those in the end. But Simon's book points us in the right direction, but we've still got another step to go, it seems to me, to find where those pressure points are. Mm -hmm. And I'll stop there. So thank you so much, Chris. I'm going to give you some uh, other provocations on the economic side. But just to repeat, there's still six seats <laughs> available here if anyone wants to become closer for the what will soon become a more dynamic conversation with the audience. So um, I was just thinking, actually, as you were talking and also, uh, Chris, your reflections, that maybe one big chunk that's sort of missing, but it it's also sort of there in terms of the underlying assumptions is capitalism, right. right? I mean, in theory, the difference between capitalism and feudalism is actually changed. We had feudalism was 500 years of inertia. Uh, then we got capitalism. Different people have written about it from Marx to Schumpeter, all that dynamism that even one of the biggest critics of capitalism talked about. That actually also requires looking at business, right? And what actually causes those differences between businesses when they innovate is something that Joseph Schumpeter talked about. He said, why do we have this theory of perfect competition that actually assumes that we have representative agents when the key feature of capitalism, which he thought differently from Keynes, you know, they all had their own theories of, of what drives change, was um, innovation. Uh, in order to talk about innovation, we have to talk about imperfect competition. So he's like, we've obviously got the wrong benchmark theory of competition when to talk about the key source of change in capitalism, you have to talk about imperfections, right? But that was also very much driven by his understanding of what causes business to change, what drives business. And I think on that, you sort of touch on it. So for example, when you talked about why carbon taxes versus direct investment um, have less of an effect, one of the ways to think about that is that one of the things that drives business expectations are not just reducing the cost of something, through some sort of indirect mechanism, right, which a carbon tax does, or even an R&D tax credit, but actually increasing the expectations of where future market and technological opportunities lie. And if you look at the history of innovation, which I wrote about in the Entrepreneurial State 1.0, we're about to again celebrate the 2.0 festival, um, has often been a, reflect, uh, a result of direct government investments. But that means you need to think about what drives business innovation. So just an opportunity for you to reflect a bit about what does your thinking um, imply for how we should also understand business behavior or in economics, the theory of the firm, right? Because you didn't really talk about that, which doesn't matter. You can't talk about everything, but there's a lot about that, I think, that's actually related to what you talk about. You mentioned Steve Chu, and I've actually been on different, yeah, definitely take your pen out because you're going to forget stuff. <laughs> uh, Steve Chu, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, I often mention him precisely to talk about why is it that we end up not getting Nobel Prize physicists or, or economists or poets uh, in, in government. And I think that's by design. The more you talk about the role of government as at best fixing market failures, at best creating a, a, an incentive for the Elon Musks of the world to innovate, instead of the truth, which is that a lot of general purpose technologies and radical innovations have actually been fruit of direct government investment, which later crowded in business investment. You need both public and private, it's never just one. Then the less exciting it is, seats in the front, there are six of them come up front, um, to actually work in government. And it's really interesting to look at when Steve Chu entered government. He entered when the US government, unlike Europe, <laughs> uh, actually decided to have a proper fiscal stimulus program after the financial crisis. We it were engaged, especially in the UK, but also in Europe, but the UK was the worst in what's called austerity, so cutting uh, public budgets, whereas the US had an 800 billion stimulus program, which initially was gonna be green directed. That was the agreement or the vision. Then the Tea Party kind of got in the way. I don't know what's happened to the Tea Party, but anyway, they're still there. They turned into something else. Um, but that's why Steve Chu entered. He was invited by Obama to steer an 800 billion stimulus program. Had they said, come in and help us devise a carbon tax or a tax credit or some sort of incentive, he'd be like, yeah, thank you very much. I'll stay at Stanford. You know, I might have, from the side, from the periphery, help you design something. So that's really important, you know, that there's a feedback between our thinking, which is where you began, 
the discussion today of what policy is for, or maybe that was upstairs, sorry, I can't remember, uh, when we were talking, what is policy for? What is the state for? What is the role of, of the design of a policy in terms of actually fostering and catalyzing that economy-wide change? And what impact does that have on the talent pool that is also attracted to government? Sociologists, by the way, call this performativity. So how you actually measure something affects what actually then happens, and that feeds back into how you theorize and measure it. So there's a whole issue there about who's both in the civil service, who's attracted to it, how they are trained, how they are measured, how they are evaluated around these issues. Right? And this is something the Institute, as you know, works a lot on. There's um, a complete fear and risk averseness today within the civil service. As soon as a mistake is made, you're in the front page of the Daily Mail, whereas the venture capitalists of the world are allowed to brag about the risks that, that they were willing to take, because just the same with government and venture capital, basically for every success, you're going to have to bear with eight or nine failures. Right, But where is that? risk lovingness uh, today in government, there's a feedback between how we frame the role of government as at best fixing on the margins versus being part of the co-creation and co-shaping of the economy. And as you know, we work a lot on this and the work we did together actually on that paper was about market shaping versus market fixing and what that means for policy uh, design. And maybe I'll just finish on that. On policy design, it's actually quite strikes me, and maybe you can just say something explicit about this, that if someone read or heard what you said quickly, they might be asking, hold on, that's completely the opposite of what we in the Institute called mission-oriented policies. Think about sectors, you said, not about economy-wide change. Think about actions and not targets, right? And I think what you're actually saying is actually quite synergetic what we think about, and you're just thinking about that difference between sectors and the economy in a more granular way. But you know, the, uh, Chris and I were both on this board for the European Space Agency, and what's so interesting about the Apollo program and today's new kind of mission to the moon is that it actually was really cross-sectoral. It was a really clear target to the moon and back in a short amount of time. It inspired people, even that famous janitor who worked in NASA who also felt he was part of the moon mission. Um, but it especially galvanized, catalyzed, crowded in investment in so many different sectors from nutrition, materials, electronics, software to deliver on a very clear goal. So I just thought, you know, and, and, and NASA was very confident about its role. It even was confident in the contracting. They had, as I talk about in my book, Mission Economy, a real uh, uh, care for the design of the contracts, including issues of fairness. They had no excess profits clauses, hugely relevant today with what we're seeing with inflation being driven by monopoly profits. They were very clear on the need for outcomes-oriented procurement to catalyze all that innovation. So maybe you could just reflect a bit more, just so we don't misunderstand you, on the difference between talking about things like targets and actually a really inspirational goal that can then catalyze with the right conditionalities, but keeping open the how, that cross-sectoral innovation, which you don't get when you just obsess about a sector, which can potentially just lead to lots of handouts, guarantees, and subsidies for sectors to be happy to getting those subsidies, guarantees, and, and bailout programs. But yeah, so yeah. thank you. Great. Well, um, that's, that's some great points to come back on. Uh, I'd, I'd try and respond briefly to each of them so we'd uh, go on to audience as well. So the, the thing about how do we understand business innovation, I suppose uh, for me the, the single most important thing that came out of our work on industrial strategy, which I felt we made some headway persuading people in government about, was that innovation is not all about R&D. And it's as much about the pull as the push. You know, you've got your R&D push and you've got your market pull. And so the question is, how do you create that market pull? As you say, it's about expectations. Expectations are enormously important. And I think um, how best to do that really changes over the course of the transition. At the very beginning stage, you know, actually investing in some guy in an R and D lab probably is the best thing you can do. Then there's some, you know, maybe you take an equity stake, maybe you give a grant. It's very small scale at the beginning. Then maybe you use public procurement to create the first niche deployment. Actually, 
the transition from sailing ships to steamships and the transition from uh, not being able to fly to having civil aviation, they both really got started through public procurement. Both of them were to do with postal services in different ways. One was the British Empire and the other one was the American um, Empire, sorry, government. Um, and so there's public procurement. And then as you get further on, you know, look at the road transport sector now, it's regulation that's forcing innovation. It's uh, zero emission vehicle mandates or efficiency standards that are so tight that you can't meet them through efficiency anymore. You have to meet them through a technology change. Those are the things. Once you're into that mass market diffusion stage, it's that kind of regulation that's your most powerful lever for driving innovation. So I think you go through a sequence and it changes over the course of the transition. The um, direct investment point, I've always uh, loved the, the story you give about Tesla and Solyndra mm -hmm. and however the, investment, the US government had taken an equity stake in Tesla, it would have paid for many, many Solyndra accidents many times over. I think that's absolutely right. And the thing that the government... And that's because Tesla and Solyndra got the same amount of money from government. Right. And there's something that I've, it's amazing that government doesn't realize that they're allowed to play in the game and be the referee at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's no other, nobody else in the economy can do that. But if you're the government, you can take a stake in an energy storage company and you can change the rules of the market so that energy storage takes off. And you don't have to be a monopoly. You don't have to take the whole market. And if you think you're getting in the way at some point, you can just bow out. But you can do this. So you have incredible chances to change a sector. And you know, if you feel you need some public money to reinvest, you can do that too. Another great example of state investment is what India's done on public procurement, first on highly efficient LED lighting, and now it's replicating it on buses. Mm. They just used bulk public procurement to get massive economies of scale, drive it down the learning curve, make every part of that supply chain more efficient, and also overcome the financing hurdle. They had a, a clever financing arrangement uh, to remove the, the barrier for the intermediaries. And it got the cost down by something like 85% over four years. And millions of households in India got lighting for the first time um, and it cut emissions. Now they're, they're doing the same thing for buses and it's brilliantly successful again. Um, on the role of the state, I mean, I really agree that if, if the government thinks it doesn't have an important role and if it never does very much and it's not very ambitious and it doesn't pay people very much, then good people leave and that is a shame. Um, finally, I think there's a really, there is a, a really interesting difference between national policy and diplomacy. And at the national level, if you can, the best thing to have is your prime minister and the whole cabinet saying, look everybody, we've got an economy-wide mission, net zero in 30 years time, and it's not an empty target. I want all of you to go away and come back with policies for everything you're responsible for about how we meet that. That's the best thing you can do at the national level. The difference globally is you don't have a global government. Yeah. So nobody gets to do that. There's no one in the world that can do that. So that the challenge is a very different one. The challenge is how do you work together? How do you negotiate? How do you agree? What do you do that makes faster progress than all of you just tackling this on your own? And that's why it's so different. You have to break it down into the meaningful chunks. Um, and once we get some of the big emitting sectors of the global economy moving rapidly in the right direction, as we're starting to do, we can also cooperate on the links between them. That's absolutely in play as well. But the difference at the moment is not between having a good sort of well worked out strategy for the global economy versus sector specific. The difference at the moment is all the countries in the world shouting at each other, getting really upset and angry with each other over economy-wide emissions targets, when most of those targets, after 30 years of discussing, they still point up and not down over the next 10 years. So really, we've got to be able to do something better. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, we're going to open it up. I have no idea when we're meant to finish, and I don't have a watch. I have a phone, but I still don't know when we're supposed to finish. So can you let me know? Um, so we have a bunch of questions in the room. We have some online. So we have one in the back, one in the front, but maybe we'll go to two online. And we'll take, do you want to take three or four at the same time? Yeah, then, that's good. Yeah, let's yeah. take four. So two, two, and then and then we'll go back to the audience. So yes, in the back, please. And sorry, can everyone say the name and where they're from, if you're a student or what sector? Um, oh.
only one? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I've been, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my interest in this is I've been researching supply chains for the last five, ten years, all the way from India, Africa to the UK. And my indigenous roots in India, while everyone's talking about fossil fuels, for the last few hundred years, the colonialism meant that we were reliant on fossil fuels. The economy wouldn't have functioned without fossil fuels. Now we're being told that we've got to divest from fossil fuels, but no one's actually asked for these cobalt mines, lithium mines. We're burning fossil fuels. That's a fact, right? So there's this delusion that renewables are fossil fuel free. Not at all, right? And the one problem I've noticed, just like the Met Police said in the 90s, hey guys, we've got institutional racism in the Met Police. My question is, when there does not seem to be much comprehension of supply chains all the way from Congo and India to the UK and saying, hey guys, listen, you thought your renewables were fossil fuel free. They're not fossil fuel yeah. free. They're conflated with the human rights abuses of women and children. Yeah. And now the problem is to electrify the whole of India is going to require removing every blade of grass and forest from my indigenous roots. Mm. So my question is, not about the resources, where they're coming from, and where they're going to, and all, all you know, Congo, and that's another big issue, the heart yeah. of Africa. My question is, if we're going to resolve this, is the climate change movement guilty of institutional racism and privilege itself? Because mm. I'm only seeing one, two, three four people who've got roots of the global south. Mm -hmm. And they're not in the panel, that's for sure. So where are the Indians, the Africans, the Chinese, the Haitians, to actually say, hey guys, you're talking about us, like you've been talking to us for the last 400 years of colonialism. Where do we get a pitch? Yeah. Where do we actually get to tell you we never gave you rights to mine our cobalt mines and rape our women so you could have an electric car? No one's talking about it. It's an excellent question. Thank and, you. And yeah. if we don't give you the rights, you're not yeah. getting your electric car. You're not yeah. getting your solar panel. Yeah. So if we get okay, sorry, proper we rights. Just have other questions. We totally got it. It's an F Thank you, by the way. Thank you for asking that. We were just in um, Argentina, where they're, of course, the, what, going to be one of the biggest suppliers of lithium. It's one of the most polluting from the climate side, let alone what's happening mm -hmm. to the indigenous communities in Latin America that actually or where these natural resources that are required for climate transition are based. So thank you, thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. We actually have a commitment in IPP to make sure our panels are diverse. We have failed on this instance, so thanks for calling it out. I appreciate it. So next question. Uh, hi, I'm Tom. I work on land use change. And uh, Simon, I think you used to work in UK government, and, but now you don't. And I was wondering if, um, if, you see, if you've seen anybody in UK government that's a bit like the, the Steve you guy from America who, <laughs> who sees how the whole system that they're working on needs to change and can say, OK, well, I need these policies, this support system, uh, these changes to happen, or whether we're just missing those kind of people. Thank you. And then we have two online. Is that right, Nye? Yeah. Great. Uh, can you give it to, sorry, can you give it to Nye? Um, so from online, uh, one of the questions that came up from Enrique uh, Bataler from the University of Valencia is, shouldn't the relations among periphery countries be considered as important as those between the core and periphery countries in order to reach critical climate goals? Is this what is now needed? And then um, another question that came up um, from Annabelle Foote is, uh, the HM Treasury does not include natural capitals as an economic driver uh, input of UK economic productivity, just as an output. How can this be changed? And in relation to that, what can be done about the political will problem in terms of addressing these issues? Thank you. Okay, that's four. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. There's some good challenges around. Look, uh, to the question over there, there's, there's, thank you for the question. There's, 
I'm sure nothing I would say that would fully do justice to all of the points you made. Um, I think I'd, a lot of us, well, all of us, our starting premise is that climate change is unfair in, in every imaginable way. Um, I think, I mean, is the climate change movement guilty of institutional racism? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I don't. I don't know what to say about it. Um, if it is, it needs to be told. The, the question I feel I can say something more about is what you mentioned about using fossil fuels for mining the materials that are then used to make renewables. Um, that can look like it's self-defeating, right? Because if and it's not just that example. There are lots of other examples. One that people often talk about is what if you've got electric vehicles and you're driving in a country where all the electricity comes from burning coal? Actually, I think that that isn't the right way of looking at it. I think you have to have transitions in each of the emitting sectors and you cannot sequence them. You cannot say, wait until we've fixed mining before we have renewable power and wait until we've got renewable power before we have electric vehicles. If you do that, we'll be on a five degree trajectory and it's game over. So you have to start change in different places at the same time. You have to understand different systems and work for a transition in each of those systems and they will merge together. We will, if we start decarbonization of power, decarbonization of mining and decarbonization of road transport, Eventually, those things will come together. Um, the, I, the mining supply chains problems you mentioned, clearly they're, they're serious and they're big. And in my view, that is the sort of thing that countries should be talking down, discussing in climate change diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Instead of sitting around going, uh, shall we you know, review our NDCs in five years' time or one year's time, they should be sitting around and having the kind of discussion that you just raised talking about where are these materials going to come from in this sector, how much do we need, what standards should we apply to production, how do we work together to enforce decent standards of human rights and sustainability. That's a useful conversation I have in climate change diplomacy. So I'm entirely with you on that. Just, just if I may, on that exact point, one of the discussions in Chile, which is currently being run by a government that uh, is quite progressive, is how do we think about copper, again, not as a sector, but as an input towards a sustainable transition. So what does that mean for copper? In the same way that in mm. Germany, the steel sector had to change what it was doing in order to be part of energy band. And that's why a sector-focused approach is often problematic. Mm. That if it's goal-oriented, it means that sector needs to change. And then over time, you can transition potentially completely away from that sector. But in the meantime, yeah. it needs to change in order to be, you know, eligible for any sort of government subsidy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, so I like the question, is there anyone in the UK government like Stephen Chu? Well, <laughs> not quite that I've come across, um, at, and not at that level of seniority, but there are some excellent people. Um, and we don't normally name civil servants in public for the stuff they do, but there was a guy working on buildings decarbonization who came up with an amazing package of policies and really thoughtful justification that actually brought together neoclassical economics, behavioral economics, and complexity economics to make three different mutually supporting yeah. arguments for this set of policies. It was absolutely brilliant. So there are people who have deep expertise who often stick it out for a very long time in the same policy area, understanding all the stakeholders, the industrial structure, the policy options. And those people are just utter gold dust. And so, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything about building up institutional capacity, because if you don't value those people, eventually you lose them. And that's quite tragic. Um, then there was a question all the way from Valencia about um, countries on the, on the periphery in the Carlota Perez sense, um, is it important for them to talk to each other? Well, I think actually, I mean, there, there are so many different patterns that can be useful in different ways. Within each sector, there can be the critical mass, but then you can also have producers and consumers. And one of the key things is the patterns of countries that can work together effectively are really different in each sector. 
So I showed road transport as China, Europe, and America as the big three that can change it and make it easier for the whole world. That sounds predictable, but think about um, land use change, think about palm oil, you've got Indonesia and Malaysia that export 85% of the world's total palm oil exports. So those are the key players that need to be at the table. Or if you think about um, shipping, you know, suddenly places like Singapore and the Netherlands become really important. So there are different countries that can be globally influential for different things. Um, even the Marshall Islands can be influential in shipping. So I think it's useful for all countries to think about where their leverage really is. Um, and then um, the Treasury doesn't include natural capital as an input to production, only as an output. Yeah, I think, good point. Yeah. And that's, that's another problem that needs to be solved. And above all, energy needs to be understood as a crucial factor in growth. Um, it's not just, as one economist once told me, just the same as shoes. If the economy gets bigger, we'll use more of it. No. There's a, there's a law of thermodynamics. There isn't a law of shoes that applies to the entire universe. Um, and how do we get more political? Well, well, we'd always like to have, but there's nothing we can do about it, uh, apart from be a political leader yourself and go and show them how it's done. Really, what I'm getting at here is that for the same level of political will and the same level of financial capital, if you challenge, channel it more effectively, focus it more effectively on the leverage points for system change, you can make faster progress. So we don't have to wait for Stephen Chu to come and be the next yeah. Prime Minister of the UK. Just please raise your hands because we have another four coming, but just quickly on the Treasury, one of the things we worked together on, I think, at least we worked on it, I'm sure you were there, in the room was how we should change the Green Book, yeah, right? which yeah. is this way that the Treasury evaluates public investment. So maybe you could just say something quickly about that, because one of the things we recommended in our, actually it wasn't in the joint paper, was that instead of using cost-benefit analysis and net present value calculations precisely because a lot of these difficult goals actually require risk and even extreme uncertainty, like Kennedy said, you know, we're doing it because it's hard, not because yeah. it's easy, then we need to be looking at all those things that happen along the way. We shouldn't fear the risk, but we need to measure the degree to which the risk taking actually then catalyzes that economy-wide innovation. Um, and for that, you need metrics, evaluation, that capture those dynamic spillovers across the economy as opposed to these kind of static. So is, is there anything just that you want to say about the Green Book, which in every country is called something else, it's just the name in the UK, of how we evaluate stuff? And let's just assume that the good stuff happens that you advocate for. How would you then evaluate it in a Green Book? Yeah, so the Green Book, for anyone who doesn't know, it's, it's an official piece of guidance for the government issued by the Treasury that is about how you make decisions. And. Um, and I remember very well, actually, that it was after one of these meetings with Treasury yeah. people um, <laughs> where a uh, were a room full. Um, I think we went out in the corridor and, Josh, you said, I've read through the Green Book. It doesn't mention the word innovation once. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's quite interesting. I need to look at this thing. And I went home and I spent one of the most boring evenings of my life <laughs> reading the whole Green Book from cover to cover. And it's true. But I found something really great in there. I found this paragraph that said, cost-benefit analysis is a marginal analysis technique. It's appropriate for situations where you don't expect any change in prices of goods and services in the economy or any change in underlying variables. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's of limited usefulness outside that context. And I thought, oh, well, what we're trying to do is not just change the prices, but yeah. create entirely new goods and services and create entirely new markets in the economy. So this is a completely different situation. And then this got us into understanding why is cost-benefit analysis so limited? And of course, one of the huge reasons is it's static. Um, it doesn't do anything to understand how you might change the economy what kind of change would be reinforcing, what kind of change would be self-limiting. Um, so it's very static. Also, it kind of lumps everything together into one measure. So you might have very diverse interests, different people caring about different things. It comes up with an arbitrarily chosen methodology for each of those things, so it can convert them all into money. And you take what was high quality information and you turn it into low quality information. Yeah. It's not very helpful for decision makers. So. Um, 
And of course, it has a status quo bias because it's easy to count your current costs. It's not easy to count your future benefits. Yeah. So you just leave them out. So um, this evolved um, into something I've, I've worked with a few other um, academics. And we've ended up saying we should be talking about risk opportunity analysis mm -hmm. instead of cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. It's the uncertainties and the dynamics that really matter. And there's this weird dichotomy between the business case, the strategic case, the economic case, yeah. and, and how they talk about the economic cases in that static way. Yeah. Um, so Chris, before we open it up again, and can we make sure there's at least two women who can ask yeah. questions? We've only had male questions yeah. so far. J just very quickly on the, on the political um, question, the this, this Stephen Chu. Stephen Chu was chosen because Obama gets it. Mm. Obama kind of gets it partly because Al Gore got it when he was a kind of spare part looking for something to do, but very passionate about it. It wasn't new. Um, and so the conditions have to be right uh, so that bright executive advisors are placed in, uh, put in powerful positions. You, you, in the book, I can mention Tim Reader's name. Tim, mm. in the Environment Agency, developed the Thames Estuary 2100 plan which was an adaptive pathways approach. It, it cut the Gordian knot of how do you plan for sea level rise when you're very uncertain what you're facing. And it was picked up around the world as the right way to approach. So it's possible for clever civil servants and advisors to be allowed to develop new ideas which actually get into the system even if the prime minister doesn't even quite realize what's going on. So, so it's a complicated issue about how these things work. And now I'm going to tread on some eggshells um, because, uh, I, you know, as, a, as an aging white middle class male, um, I'm in a slightly tricky position in terms of diversity. Although by marriage, I am connected with a third world um, country. So, you know, I have some um, uh, personal interests and, and, and awareness. But I'm just going to give a, a little anecdote. A few years ago, um, uh, there was a convention of climate skeptics here in London, so climate deniers. Um, and, and I knew some of them because they'd been trolling me on the internet quite unkindly. Um, and I thought, well, you know what, it'd be really quite interesting to go and spend a couple of days hearing what they're about. You know, is there, is there anything in there that I really should pay attention to or, or not? And it was a very interesting experience. And I, I went there as me, but I, but I didn't advertise that I was there. And I think I was there by mistake, partly. Um, but in a coffee break, a, a gentleman came up to me and said, uh, you're Chris Rapley, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, I'm not having you tell me I'm a bad person. So I said, well, I don't even know you. I, you know, I've, how could I possibly? And he said, no. He said, everything you stand for tells me that you think that I'm a bad person. He said, I'm retired now, but I was an oil company geophysical exploration expert. He said, I spent my entire career very successful at it. I found huge reserves of, of oil and gas. And he said, uh, I got paid well for it. I traveled all over the world. I had a most interesting life. But he said, throughout that time, I felt I was making the world a better place. And I'm not having you tell me that I made it a worse place. And I said, well, you did make it a better place in so many ways. Look at the lifestyle that we all enjoy now. And that has been built on fossil fuels. And it's still being supported 80% on fossil fuels. But now that we know that there's a big downside, now that we know there's a problem, you're just the sort of person, surely, who would be sitting around the table to help us come to a, a, a sensible solution. And whether it's to do with do we need the cobalt? Do we need to be dragging it out of uh, you know, nations that are being exploited? You know, how do we move from where we are to where we're going in a way that is ethically, technologically, economically, socially the most sensible route from A to B? That's the conversation we all need to be having. So I understand the upset. You know, we can all apologize for what other people did, you know, and, and which I was part of. But in a way, we have to confront where we are now and try and have a sensible and ethical and adult conversation to go forward. So that, that would be my reaction yeah, to that inclusive. question. I mean, I it, abso the absolutely. The absolutely. And, oh, and I should say that I ran a program with 79 nations in it, and we put huge amounts of effort to make sure that everybody had a voice in that, mm -hmm. in that uh, program. Great. So uh, two women here, and then we have uh, Jake in the back. And then we'll take one more online. 
Thank you. Um, I hope I'm, I'm just being a woman. Um, I run the Center for International Peace Building and I spent about seven years in the Pacific looking at climate change and the effects of climate change. And one thing that stuck out was that they have a completely different paradigm about how to live their life. Yeah. And you talked about this when you talked about ecosystems yeah. uh, and the dynamic factors within ecosystems as opposed to a machine-based system. Uh, and so which doesn't allow for a circular economy, which is obviously an underlying big principle that we're all working for. Uh, and I think we still, and you pointed it out throughout your talk, we're still kind of getting stuck on a paradigm, conceptual, linguistic um, hooks that are um, fixing us into a, a way of thinking that is completely dysfunctional. And it's very difficult to always call it out, but you do, and we all have, I think, a duty to call it out when we see it. Um, and I think it, it's terribly important to also kind of apply this to the governance systems that we have. Uh, and you mentioned this in some other places, you know, like the, the, the kind of um, meta-governance approach where looking at hierarchical governance, where is that appropriate? Or at uh, um, um, network governance, where is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. Or at market governance, where is that appropriate? Which of these systems do we want to incentivize? And which ones are in, inappropriate mm -hmm. for the task we want to do, mm. blah, 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 blah. So I think there are kind of a lot of these issues that are very, very kind of underlying your thinking in your mm. book, which I think we need to all become much more conscious of, I think. Great question. Thank you. You can pass it in the back. Um, my question is about, um, I love the idea of focusing on the um, le levers where you can get maximum impact, so you put your effort where it has the maximum impact. But there's always going to be a drag from the incumbent system that, that sort of holds that back. And I really struggle with understanding how we can remove that drag. Because you mentioned about replacing a feudal system with a capitalist system. But it strikes me that we seem to have shifted the feudalism from the bloodline, from feudalism to the dollars. Right, so we've still got a kind of feudalistic yeah. system, yeah. but it's feudalistic on where the money is yeah. and where the power is. Mm -hmm. So how do you get rid of that drag? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great point. Jay, and, and while the microphone is moving, we actually have a, a whole project here called Algorithmic Rents and looking at the feudal rents that are currently embedded in how we construct algorithms. So yeah. it's a different it's a sector. Yeah. System, totally, yeah, yeah. Accounting yeah. Accounting yeah. Um, my name is Jake Sumlin. I've worked in local, national, and regional government and in the private sector, voluntary sector. And partly, and I'm very interested in systems change, and particularly from a climate perspective. And I guess what's been inserted into it now is the pace and scale of change that is needed. And the timing element is so critical to our decisions. But in sort of creating that systems change, and I think it's also useful to think of places and how that happens. And I know from experience of government, it's incredibly siloed. It's incredibly difficult to join up. You will have seen that as well, Simon. And I think there's an opportunity at a regional and local authority level as the conveners of place to really create at-scale change. And actually, they're part of the, I guess, uh, landscape which could go faster you know, lots of social homes could get changed very quickly on retrofit. Yeah. You know, that could be scaled quickly. They're the, you know, they deliver public transport systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that could be scaled up with jobs and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And that's done at a place level. So that's, I, I just think that we're overlooking some of that. And particularly in our bus system at the moment, I feel that's mm -hmm. a big part of the solution. Whoever forms the next government must drive it at a particular place and local authority level. Thank you. Uh, why don't we get one or two from Nye, and then I think, oh, no, sorry, one more in the front here. Start. Thanks, Simon. Um, two, one, two very quick questions. One is really about something that, um, you know, Chris talked about, which is disinformation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of doing um, all of this in an environment, in a kind of hyper-social media world where, you know, there's rampant disinformation. So maybe some reflections on, on mm. that aspect. And the other question was really about gas. I mean, you've talked a bit about coal and, you know, you, you, you mentioned methane. I think one of you mentioned methane. But this whole role of sort of the, tran you know, gas, which has been seen as a sort of transition fuel, which is really not with its emissions on methane and, 
Yeah. We know the rest of it, but it's just I'd like to hear a little bit about what you're thinking on that okay. too. And sorry, where do you work? Uh, my name is Aditi Thorat, and I work for Global Commons Alliance. Thank you. So, Naime, we have time for one because we only have about ten minutes. Oh, I'll, I'll respond. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, both of you can respond to anyone you want. Um, um, so this question is from Manuel Lira. Um, Manuel writes, "My interest is in net in the net zero effort today. Carbon footprint." Focused on focuses on scope one and two, but scope three alone captures more than 80% of the total carbon footprint. Uh, don't you think scope three should be included in all financial reports, mainly due to the fact that it is a link with financials reports and transactions that could uh, that could perform uh, that could be performed in a third world country with limited uh, environmental laws or enforcement measures? Thanks. So. Hmm. About 10 minutes to continue. Okay. Uh, so, first, the thank you. I, I really like the way you put that um, about the, the evolutionary, uh, in the paradigm, the paradigm that this is about ecosystems. Mm. When I tried to, when I got near the end of this thing, and I thought, well, I've talked about three different systems that are all really buggered up. What's the connection? Or are they just three that are? coincidentally all completely wrong but in different ways and I thought there's a really strong connection and it is that in each of those three systems we've got reductionist thinking and we need systems thinking um, in you know economics very obviously we have these stupid models with representative agents as if the behavior of one person or firm represents the behavior of the entire economy it's like Steve Keen says you can't model a, a water molecule and expect that to show you different weather patterns. Of course it doesn't. The system behavior is not an extrapolation of the individual behavior. And that same kind of thinking in economics led to the reduction of thinking in diplomacy, as if each country can just reach net zero emissions on its own. Of course it can't. We're all part of a global economy and it's global systems of production and consumption and governance that we have to change in each of these big emitting sectors. Um, and even in the science, Surprisingly, you know, there's maybe more systems thinking in science than in economics, but still a lot of reductionism. And you can look at the effect of climate change on individual crops, but it's not the same as understanding the risk to global food security. Really yeah, yeah. Um, and a, another aspect of that is the first person perspective that the reductionist approach or, you know, the broader philosophy that that's part of stands outside of a system and thinks of itself as separate. But of course, if you want good risk assessment for climate change, you have to start by asking what are your interests. And in the economy, you have to remember you have agency. Don't ask a consultant to predict what the cost of clean technology is going to be. Implement the policy that will change the cost of that clean technology so that you have what you want. And diplomacy as well. Remember that interests change over the course of time. And your point about governance, absolutely. You know, one of the, the great things that I learned when I started working with David Victor on the climate change diplomacy, there was a moment where I suddenly thought, oh, this is the evolutionary version of diplomacy, where you don't think that everyone's interests are fixed at the beginning and they're never going to change. You realize they will change. So the whole game is, how do you construct a process that will change interests over the time and draw in more actors as you go along? So you start from very few, you end up with the entire world. It's a question of how you grow that coalition as you go along. And that is related to the question about local government, which I, I totally agree. Um, when we did our industrial strategy work, there was a great team, probably still is, local energy team, is probably still trying to do the same thing and still being thwarted. And they observed that we've got these policies for deploying different clean technologies in different ways at different times in different parts of the country. And at some point, these all have to be integrated. And they said, well, look, we'd really like to just do the home retrofits and the EV charging infrastructure installation and the renewable power and the EVs and just do it all at once. Can't we do that? And the central government just went, no, nah, not really interested. We'd rather have central policies that are all separate, please. And I completely agree we should do that locally. More than that, we should treat it as trial and error because... When you can't predict the future, trial and error is what you do. So let's make a virtue of the fact that we can do it differently. Experiment with deep, integrated, cross-sector decarbonization in different places around the country, doing it in different ways. 
see what works and then scale it up. That's what evolution does. It sees what works and then it scales it up. So we should absolutely do that. Um, the disinformation thing, uh, sorry, where was the person who, sorry, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a pain in the ass, isn't it? <laughs> I looked at the media reporting around the net zero strategy that came out a few weeks ago, and I was amazed. We've still got the Telegraph and the Daily Mail giving platforms to people that come out with lies. It's unbelievable. And I keep finding myself wondering, who can take these people on? It's one thing you can't do in government. You can't go out and bash the media for lying, even when they are lying, shamelessly. You can't do it. The government doesn't have that agency. Maybe campaigners can, but it's going to be hard. But I wish, you know, Extinction Rebellion or the other guys that sat on the M25, I wish they blockaded the Daily Mail instead and made, <laughs> made their life difficult. It's what they should be doing. Like, I'm saying that on the record. Please go out and make their lives <laughs> difficult because they deserve it. One of, actually heard it on the radio this morning. The most important court case um, going on the, in the world right now, I think, is this uh, company that made the voting machines in America suing Fox News for lying about them knowledgeably, deliberately lying to the entire American people. Well, I hope that court case goes ahead and I hope they win. And I hope similar cases can be brought against those who are knowingly lying about climate change because it's disgraceful. Um, gas. I'm doing all the, the ones where I have most to say first, so I'm going to finish very anticlimactically. But um, <laughs> gas, I, I think, like, I always think about the transition from the demand side, that you change the demand and then the supply will really look after itself. So you change the power sector, you don't need to burn coal so much. You change transport, nobody wants oil anymore. Gas is a bit more complicated because it's spread between industry and heating and some bits of power. But it's fundamentally the same. Like change those end uses one by one and gas will go away. And we're already in a situation in countries that are far advanced compared to the UK where you can have heat pumps that are cheaper than gas. You know, if you've got low cost electricity and you've looked after, you've grown your heat pump supply chains, that can be a cheap way of heating. Um, and yeah, finally, the, the scope three question, I think, comes back. Can you just let everyone know what scope one, scope two, scope Oh, three. God. Oh, that, just... that, that's, that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> I, 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 can, I, I can never remember because it just really annoys me. It's, it's part of the reductionist thing. The, the reductionist paradigm is every man and his dog has to have a net zero target. And then not only that, but we're going to kind of really keep notes on them all and account for it and then tell them when they've been bad and give them a slap. That's not how you do system change. I mean, yes, the whole scope three can be useful in a sense of you get companies to use their buying power. So Google goes out and it wants, it says, you know, we're not just gonna, uh, well, it's, I don't know what's their core thing. Uh, but Google goes out and says, we're gonna buy only renewable energy from now on. Great, that's massive buying power. That's really, really helpful. It's a good thing for corporates to do that. So I don't really mean to downplay it. But the point is, if you have Their a difficult business, billion, yeah, yeah. But let's say you're talking about Shell, and we all want to be mean to Shell, right, because they're an oil company. But how are they supposed to reduce their scope three emissions? That's decarbonization of the entire economy. Of course they can't do it. It's not up to them to change the structure of the aviation sector or the shipping sector or even road transport. They don't have the energy, to, the agency to do that. It needs the government to go and do that, uh, regulate the crap out of it, and then that will solve their scope three problem for them. Great. Thank you. So we've got two minutes left. I'm going to give oh, them to you. Oh, oh wow. Well, very, very quickly, um, you know, we know that our rivers and beaches are being polluted at present, uh, but the point you're making is that the public square, the discussion is, yeah. is polluted as well by toxic input um, yeah. from the well-known. I mean, you know, if we bulldoze the Sun, the Express, the Mail, um, uh, who else? Yeah, the Telegraph, the Times, uh, probably Eaton and Harrow and a few others as well. You know, that would be the quickest way to make some institutional change in the UK, actually. I'm not, 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 not necessarily. <laughs> Um, but rem remember what, rem rem remember what Alexander Nix um, from Cambridge Analytica said, it doesn't have to be true, it just has to be believed. And remember that for 20 years, um, there's been a huge uh, input of money, billions, it was estimated at a billion dollars a year a decade ago from the vested interests in the United States to disseminate disinformation. 
Interestingly, there was a tipping point um, because the, the first eight or nine books that I came across that were full of disinformation about climate change had been privately published and funded through this various front organizations being funded by that flow of money. And it went through a tipping point to where they got the social media uh, backup to then uh, that other authors started to publish them on themselves. And those just faded into the background like the Cheshire Cat What's smile. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through, but it's quite. You, you need to look at Naomi Reshkis's book on uh, on uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Merchants uh, of Doubt. Yeah, Merchants, Merchants of Doubt. Doubt. Yeah. Um, but um, what, what I just wanted to read, and, and, and this is from 500 years ago, and I've been holding this because I, this this really this is Machiavelli, the Prince. Machiavelli has a very very bad press. You know, he could have done with a better comms office. But I'm going to just quote you. There is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to lead in the introduction of a new order of things. And boy, are we trying to introduce a new order of things. Because the innovator has for enemies all of those who've done well under the old condition and lukewarm defenders in those who may do well under the new. The coolness arises partly from fear of the opponents who have the laws on their side, as we see uh, in many uh, aspects of modern world in the UK. And then there's a lovely twist at the end. And partly from the incredulity of men, excuse the, the, the men, who do not readily believe in new things until they have had long experience of them. Mm -hmm. So there's some really important ideas there. The vested interest will always fight you. And those who, whose interests you are pursuing are very dubious about it for a long time. And that's, that's a bit of an elephant in the, in the room and in the book that, yeah. that is the next thing to tackle, it seems to me. And even that uncertainty, not risk. So yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.